Okay, here we go. Uh, chapter, which is this one? 13, uh, Deserts and Wind, basically. Um, the last time, last few chapters, we've been talking about parts of the hydrologic cycle, uh, mainly dealing with water and how water moves materials, how it, how it can erode materials and whatnot. We're going to talk about a different agent of change on the surface of the earth today, and that's going to be wind. Um, wind is nowhere near as powerful as water, but it still does have an effect. So we're going to be talking about wind and desert environments. So first and foremost, uh, let's talk about deserts or dry lands, arid lands. Um, arid lands are lands that receive less than 50 centimeters of rainfall a year, more or less, less than about 20 inches, 24, 22 inches, somewhere in that ballpark. Deserts are a very specific subset of arid lands that receive less than 25 centimeters of rainfall a year, about around 10 inches or so, 10 to 12 inches. I usually like to use 12 inches. It's a nice round number. Um, here in Santa Cruz County, in Nogales and Rio Rico, we're not a desert, no matter what they want to call us. They can call us the Sonoran Desert or the Chihuahuan Desert all they want. Technically speaking, we're not a desert. We receive too much rainfall. We are an arid grassland. Um, we receive, on average, about 17 inches of rainfall in Santa Cruz County a year. Now, where do we find these arid lands? Well, we find them in two different areas. Okay, okay, yes. We find them uh, around the subtropics in the low-latitude deserts. Um, these are basically going to be in the vicinities of the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, so around 23 and a half degrees north or south latitude. Um, these are areas where we have what we call the, the Hayden cell the Hayden cells. Um, if we look at, let's see, I think I've got, if we look at, uh, yeah, if we look at a picture of the earth in terms of its g very general atmospheric rotate, uh, atmospheric circulation systems, what we see is we have a low pressure belt along the equator. <laughs> okay, Elpis, come on, kitty. We have a, a, a low pressure center around the equator, which is air rising. That air comes back down and falls down near the tropics, uh, to up to 30 degrees north lat or south latitude, and this air, as it's coming down, is dry, and as it comes down, it heats up, so it becomes even drier. So we have these sinking air pre masses that are warmed, and therefore they dry out. We also have the mid latitude trop, uh, mid latitude deserts, which are normally between 30 and 35 degrees north or south latitude. Again, they they do get some of the same effects from the descending air, but they also can be located in the deep interior of continents with a lot of uh, mountain ranges. So what happens is the mountains act like sponges, and they basically squeeze the air as it goes over it. So Think about where we're at in southern Arizona. Um, several tens of millions of years ago, we were actually a, not a tropical, but a temperate rainforest, meaning there was a lot more rain, a lot more heavy vegetation in the area. What changed? Well, the Sierra Nevada mountains are what changed. The Sierra Nevada mountains rose up and became higher than the basin and range of southern Arizona. When that happened, as the air comes in from the west, as it goes up over a mountain range, it gets pushed up. As it gets pushed up, it cools. That cooling causes condensation. Condensation leads to cloud formation. If you get enough condensation, it leads to precipitation. And so each mountain range, as it pushes the air up, is effectively wringing a sponge or wringing a towel out and squeezing water out of it, dry, making that air drier and drier. On the back side of the mountain, as the air comes back down again, it, as it comes down, it compresses. As the air compresses, it heats up. If you've ever used a bicycle pump, then you'll know that when you pump the air and have to air up a, a tire or a, uh, an air mattress, the end of the pump, especially where the air is getting compressed through the hose, can get to be very warm if not hot. And that's because of the compression factor. 
So when you get on the back side of the mountains, you'll see what is called a rain shadow effect. If the rain shadow effect is large enough, it creates a desert. You are just a needy kitten today, aren't you? Okay. Latest rescue kitty. Three quarters cat, as you can see. She's missing a leg and she's blind. So she's just being needy. Um, so what are the geologic processes that are going to take place in these areas? Well, weathering is not going to be anywhere near as effective. Remember, when we were talking about weathering, chemical weathering requires warm, wet conditions. So there's not a lot of water in an arid region, so you don't get a lot of chemical weathering. Uh, mechanical weathering really works better in areas where you have uh, water and temperature variations that are very strong. Again, without a lot of water, hard to get some of that weathering happening. With that said, you do see weathering in, the, in these environments. Um, you do see unaltered rock and mineral fragments. In part, you can have it due to, if you remember when we talked about the thermal expansion contraction of materials, um, occasionally frost wedging in the right situation. So you do get some, but it's not as prevalent. But mechanical weathering is going to be the weathering type that is going to be predominant in arid lands. Now, what little chemical weathering does happen is going to create some materials. It, very thin soils, very poorly organized soils to begin with. Um, they're thin. You can get clay and oxidized minerals, primarily the things you're going to see in arid environments. Now, with that said, just because an environment is dry does not mean water is not important. Even in the driest of deserts, water is still one of the major forces of change in the surface of that land. Um, if you look at uh, arid environments, one of the things they have in common is that the stream beds are dry, the river beds are dry most of the time. And these are what we call ephemeral or intermittent streams. They only flow when it rains. So not like the Nogales Wash, which flows most of the time, although technically speaking, that's because the Mexican sewer and water systems leak like a sieve. Uh, but if you go to many of the other channels, the Santa Cruz River for the most part, uh, in, in certain air, in most of its run, um, Sonoida Creek, Josephine Canyon, Peck Canyon, Agua Fria Wash, Diablo Wash, Cottonwood Wash, um, Red Rock, Harshaw, etc., etc., etc. Most of those do not run unless it has been raining or is raining recently. So we call these ephemeral or intermittent streams. And now, in the American Southwest, we have one of two names for them. We call them washes or arroyos. Um, if we were to be in Arabia or North Africa, it's a wadi, W-A-D-I. If we were in South America, it's a dunga, D-O-N-G-A. And if we were in India, it's a nulla, N-U-L-L-A-H. Um, but basically, they're all the same thing. They're these stream channels that are just dry most of the time except when it rains or rains hard as the case may be now in the deserts when it does rain it tends to come quick and it tends to come heavy um, just think of our monsoons for the most part um, our monsoons are very typical for the types of rains you do tend to see in deserts where you get a very sudden downburst very heavy rain very short period of time um, because of this, one of the things that you'll note is in the as the area gets drier and drier, just think about going to Phoenix, you see less and less vegetation. And the vegetation is more and more adapted for drought conditions. Um, however, with that said, without a lot of vegetation, there's not a lot of stuff holding the soil in place. Therefore, you get when you do get a rainfall event, you do get water flow, you get a lot of erosion. Yes, you are... You never do this except when I'm trying to talk. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So most of the work is done by the, wa by the water. Now, let's bring this a little closer to home. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet, we will talk about when we talk about mountain development, is types of mountain ranges. 
We live in an area, it's a very specific type of landscape that we call the basin and range. Um, basically what happened is several million years ago, there was an extension event. The crust underneath where we are right now was pulled apart. When it pulled apart, it didn't just pull apart this way. It pulled apart and it did this. So it, you had this rotational uh, aspect when it pulled apart, what we call listric faults. And we ha I know we haven't talked about faults yet. We don't really get into listric faults in this level of geology, but it's a curved fault, basically, is all that really means for you right now. But it pulled apart like this. And it pulled apart in such a way that the distances between points of land essentially doubled. So the distance between us and Sierra Vista, for example, is more or less, let's say, 60 miles. Well, before the basin and range pulled apart, it was 30 miles. So it basically doubled. So we had a thinning of the crust. Um, this caused mountains to uplift through what we call block faulting. In this case, it was block faulting that was like this. There's another type of block faulting called Horst and Graben which is bounded by very specific types of faults and pieces are moving up, pieces are moving down. But we're based on a range where we have this rotational movement instead. Um, but this creates some very interesting features. We have in what we call interior drainages. Uh, we're, we're, with river systems, we talked about drainages, you know, that go from point A to point B and, you know, the, the continental divide, how water to fall on one side of the continental divide makes it into the Pacific Ocean. On the other side, it makes it into either the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico. Interior drainages don't go anywhere. Uh, if you've ever been to Wilcox, Arizona, Wilcox is, in, uh, is located on what's called the Wilcox Playa. A playa is a flat basin area in a uh, in what's called an interior drainage. So if you go to the center point, the lowest point in the Wilcox area, everything, if you take a 360 degree view, everything around you is draining towards you. It's all coming to that point. None of the water that goes into the Wilcox playa makes it out of there physically through, a, uh, through groundwater or through um, surface water aspects to make it to the Pacific Ocean. It, ha it can only leave by evaporation. So you have these internal drainages uh, that basically water just goes into the central point and you get these playas. Uh, and if the playa has water on it, which Wilcox usually does during the monsoon season, it becomes what we call a playa lake. If it lasts long enough or it gets enough water into it, it can actually create salt flats. Um, so it's not uncommon to find evaporite minerals in these playa deposits. Um, other features that we can have are alluvial fans. We've talked about alluvial fans before, but just to go over it again, an alluvial fan is a feature of deposition caused uh, generally in areas of arid regions, but where you have, there's a good picture, where you have basically material coming out of the mountains in an arid region this is this one right here is an alluvial fan right here this is a second alluvial fan right here creates this semicircular fan shaped wedge of material it tends to have graded streams uh, uh graded uh, braided streams on it. it tends to have graded sedimentation in it from time to time because of the way that it floods um you you tend to see gradation in sediments also from the head of the fan down to the toe of the fan uh, also in the vertical, so you see all these different features that say to you that there's a lot of energy change happening in the system. So it's dropping its sediment, it's coming choked, it's finding new ways, spreading out. And that's an alluvial fan. If you have multiple alluvial fans that are overlapping each other, they can create a surface that we call a bajada. And that's all a bajada is, is multiple overlapping alluvial fans. Um, if you look at certain mountain ranges in in Arizona, you can actually kind of see this bench-like slope that's coming off of the mountain at the base of the mountain that usually is going to be a bajada. Uh, let's see. Um, now, the mountains are continuing to erode. Now, one of the interesting things about the basin and range is that there are some areas where if you go to the basin... 
the Valley Four, like uh, the Santa Cruz River in Rio Rico. If you were to drill down and try to find where the bedrock is at the bottom of that f valley, uh, you find that probably about a thousand feet down till you hit bedrock. If you go into Pima County, just north of Elephant Head, because uh, there's a fault system there, you have to go down over 10,000 feet to the hit bedrock in the Santa Cruz Valley there. Um, now, what this means is that that valley is being filled in with sediment. Where's that sediment coming from? It's coming from the surrounding mountains. So literally what can happen in the Basin Range and what does happen if you've ever gone out to California, taking I-8 East, um, you note that the mountains seem to get smaller and smaller and smaller and turn into hills, just these hills uh, in, these, uh, in these broad valleys. Those mountains were literally the size of the mountains around us at one point. But what's happened is, is they've weathered away and they've buried themselves in their own sediment. And these produce erosional remnants that we call inselbergs. They're basically mountains that are buried in their own erosional debris. Um, so that, that creates some interesting things that we can see around us. And it also gives us an, an idea about the age and development of the system. Because eroding mountains is not a fast process. It's a slow process. So what that tells us is the basin and range in western Arizona is actually much older than the basin and range in eastern Arizona. Um, now, when it comes to wind in the desert, wind is the major is one of the major ways that material gets transported. Um, it gets transported in two ways, kind of like what we talked about with water. We have um, material that's getting moved as a bed load, and this is mainly because wind is about a thousand times less dense than water, so it doesn't have the ability to pick up as much material or carry as much material. It doesn't have the ability to keep that material suspended in it for as long either. So we have the a bed load when the wind is blowing. Uh, again, much like we have with running water, it's stuff rolling along the surface or even skipping along the surface through saltation. Again, saltation is where you've got some sort of obstacle in the surface. I'm going to try to do this about right there. And mm, that'll work. Let's see. There we go. It comes along, hits, doink, up. And down. So saltation is again that skipping process of materials that are rolling, hitting a larger object that's on the on the fl on the uh, floor or on the bed that it can't it can't push out of the way, so it bounces up and then comes back down. Um, actually, when we look at a sandstorm, about twenty or twenty five percent of the material is moving this way. It's really only about the top five or six or top, top bottom five or six feet of a sandstorm that's doing this um when you look at a sandstorm and uh i think um yeah this is uh what we here we call them a haboob in phoenix this is one from phoenix right here uh that is almost a mile high uh dust storm rolling in um this 25 per, 20 to 25% of the material is down here in the first six feet. It's just sand or even small gravel if the wind is strong enough. The rest of it is just dust, windblown dust that's carried through suspension in the air. Um, so, but the majority of what could be damaging, <laughs> at least physically damaging, is going to be in that first six feet. Um, it creates a uh, scour. I've seen cars that have actually been in, in, uh, bad enough sandstorms, usually in some of the nasty storms that they can get in the Sahara, where basically the paint is etched off of it and the windows are etched. Um, now, in terms of erosion features, uh, wind is relatively insignificant for erosion. It can cause erosion, certain erosional features to form, but it's not that great. Um, it takes a lot of time for, generally speaking, unless there are certain very peculiar situations. But what happens is some of the things that we see is uh, deflation. And deflation is where the wind is taking fine grain materials away from a location. So it's lifting loose material that it can carry and blowing it away. 
This can create depressions that we call blowouts, uh, shallow depressions that are that are to that. Can also create a feature called desert pavement, which is pretty cool. Um, you can experiment with this for yourself. As a very simple way to do is is um, uh, messy, so don't do it inside unless you feel like cleaning up. Um, get some flour and get some chocolate chips. Okay, and no, we're not making cookies. Um, mix the chips in with the flour, put it in a little pan, if you will. You want a lot of chips and a lot of flour. You want a thick layer of this stuff. And then take it outside and blow on it hard at a shallow angle. You're going to blow the flour out. The chips are going to remain. And if you get enough chips together, they'll create a solid surface on the flour protecting the flour underneath. That's essentially the way desert pavement forms. Fine grain material gets blown away leaving the larger rocks that cannot be blown away on the surface. And as more and more rocks are left on the surface, you get this interlocking pattern of rock that basically forms a pavement-like surface. And it can look like pavement, especially when it gets uh, magnesium oxide, which is a uh, sometimes referred to as desert varnish that will form on rocks. Um, so we get, those are some of the deflation surfaces we can get. We can also get products created by abrasion. Um, a little less common unless you have an area that has very specific wind conditions. Um, some of the abrasion products really require very specific wind conditions to create. One is a Ventifact. What a Ventifact is, is it's a wind sculpted rock that has been faceted, made to have ang flat angular sides. Um, basically, let me try to draw it for you. Basically, what happens is if you have a rock that's embedded in a surface like this, the wind comes in, and let's just say for the sake of argument, the wind comes in different directions, different times of the year. So one time of the year, it's coming in like this, and what it's going to do is it's going to flatten this surface like that. The wind comes in from this direction, different time of year, it's going to flatten the surface like that. And it's going to take a rounded rock and make it somewhat angular. Okay, And depending on the number of different directions the wind comes through during the course of the year, it can create multiple facets on the rock. Beyond uh, event effects, we can also get what's called a yardang. Uh, yardangs are actually pretty interesting. They're wind sculpted features. Um, uh, there's actually a good picture of a decent picture of a Ventifact right there in your book, page uh, 331. I think, is that your, Yeah, that's your book. Um, no, Mac fell on. Um, some other things that we can see is a Yardang. Now, Yardangs are these wind sculpted features. Um, that are above ground surfaces. They can be streamlined. They can look really cool. Uh, they can look really weird. Uh, for example, that would be classified as a yardang. Right there. This could become a yardang. And it's pretty close to it. It's actually in a blowout. But it's, it's not wind sculpted yet. Um, but a yardang is basically this sculpted ridge parallel to the wind. It can sometimes they can create elongated features. They can be sh other shaped features. Are pretty interesting. Um, but they tend to be limited in their vertical. I mean, you can see in this one, it's not going to take too much more to erode this to a point where it will not be able to structurally hold the material up above it and it falls over. Um, let's see. Uh, then, of course, we have the deposits, the wind-blown deposits. And you're going to want to pay attention to these, and that's going to be the sand dunes. Um, sand dunes are the major deposit features of a desert. Now, generally speaking, sand dunes have a typical shape. They're either going to be symmetrical or they're going to be asymmetrical. And that actually makes a difference for us. A symmetrical dune means that the air is moving back and forth 
roughly equally during the course of the day. So in one direct time it's going east, one direct time it's going west. And that will create a more symmetrical shape. Asymmetrical dunes show us that the wind is blowing in one direction primarily all the time. Um, and I'm going to draw this out for an asymmetrical dune, dune because it's easier to do. So for an asymmetrical dune, if we have a surface like this, the dune comes in and looks, eh, let's draw that a little more asymmetrical than I did. There we go, like this. So we have here an asymmetrical dune. This tells us the direction of wind flow. Just looking at this, we know the direction of wind flow. Very simple. It's in this direction, okay? Because the flatter side always faces the direction the wind is coming from. The steeper side is the direction the wind is going in. In fact, actually, the steepest angle on this face is going to be in the direction the wind was actually traveling at that time the sand was deposited. So we can actually use this in the geologic record to figure out what way the wind was blowing in ancient paleo deserts that left behind sand dune deposits. So the sand rolls up, falls over. So we have on this face the slip face and the leeward face. Okay? Ah, put that down for a moment. Now, um, I'm sorry, the windward face and the, the leeward. The slip face is also the leeward face and the windward face. Let me draw that up there for you. So the windward face faces the wind. The leeward, leeward face or the slip face faces the direction it's going in. The slip face is at what we call the angle of repose. The angle of repose is the steepest angle that dry material of a given size and shape can easily maintain uh, and, and not f slide down at. It's basically the maximum slope. Um, one of the things that we see is that that for sand is around 34 degrees, but it can be different for different objects. Different sizes, different shapes of, of objects really can change this. So, Usually it's going to be between 30 and 35 degrees. Uh, sand is about 34 degrees. It's called, one of the reasons they call it the slip face is any little disturbance on that face and sand is going to slip down. But it shows us the direction of travel. Now, what's interesting is, is that this is where on that slip face, the sand is layering one layer on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. And that's what gives us the cross bedding look. And as I've drawn it here, what ends up happening, and I'll use blue for the interior, I hope this shows up, we have these layers for the slip face that are like this. And at some point, they get left behind. You get a layer left behind, so you have that cross bedding left behind showing the presence or the passage of the dune. And that creates your cross bedding features. Um, up in the Flagstaff area, there are some sandstones. Uh, there's or not some a sandstone called the Coquinino sandstone. The Coquinino sandstone has dunes that are on the order of ten meters high. Do, uh, uh, at least cross beds that are up to ten meters high, and that's actually from a desert that was there back in the Permian. Um, and we can actually measure the direction that those sand dunes were traveling in at different times of the, or in different parts of the layer of sandstone and actually figure out how the wind patterns changed in the desert over time, which is pretty cool. Um, they typically move based on how fast the wind goes, so they can, they move fairly slowly. But uh, the type of dunes really matters based on the amount of sand that's available and the nature of the area of how the wind is blowing. Um, I want to show you some of them. I'm probably not going to actually quiz you on this that much. No, Elpis, you're not going to climb up onto the computer, onto there. But basically you have like Barkin dunes which are parabola-shaped dunes, but the horns of the dune 
face the direction the wind is moving in. You have uh, the opposite of that would be a parabola, a parabolic dune, which fa the horns face the direction the wind came from. Usually, it's a difference in the amount of sand and whether or not this the, where the wind is coming from that plays that that plays a difference in that. Um, you can have yeah, there's the parabolic dune here. So barking dune, parabolic dune. You have these longitudinal dunes um, that basically are these sort of uh, symmetrical dunes that go along the direction of the wind. Sometimes it's, act, as your book shows here, sometimes it's wind that's circulating around, kind of rotating. Sometimes it can be wind that's coming in from uh, two different directions during the course of the day by about an angle of... Uh, Less than 90 degrees between the two of them. But they're creating one direction. Um, there's also the star-shaped dune, which is a which is a, basically a dune that is you know, basically star-shaped because it's, a, it's piled up by wind coming from different directions, different times of the day or year. You have your regular transverse dune, which is just a, a, a frontal wave of sand that moves through an area. Um, let's see. The other type of feature that you can get is los. Los is a very, very fine grain material. We think los actually is developed at glaciers. So we think it probably is till or dr stratified drift that gets picked up by the wind and deposited in other areas. It's that fine grain. It's very powdery material. Um, it can also maybe come from deserts, but we think glaciers are the greatest source of it. Uh, you have extensive deposits of it in not only Western North America, uh, but China as well. Um, the Grain Belt, the Midwest, is a massive low deposit. Um, in some areas, it's over 30 meters thick. This is the area where if you ever heard about the, um, the Dust Bowl era the, during the Great Depression, it was a time when a lot of this material, because unfortunately humans, well, we have a great propensity for gathering knowledge and passing knowledge on. Sometimes we've got to learn the same lessons over and over again. Um, the way we plowed the Great Plains, the way we farmed them, was not good for the land. And in a drought situation, it caused a lot of that land to be blown away. Literally, in some areas, almost 100 feet of material blown away in what they called the black blizzards of the dust bowl. Um, but that loess is just this fine grain material that get that can be moved around from place to place. It makes for a great soil where it can accumulate, but it it's easily moved. So with that, I'm going to close it up. Uh, this is a fairly short, you know, obviously without the interaction that we're, we normally have within a class, these lectures are going to be shorter and faster. That's in part why I'm posting the video so you can listen to them a couple of times and then we'll talk about it during the uh, virtual class uh, and we'll see what questions you guys have. But hopefully um, that helps you with understanding deserts and wind. Um, we'll continue this forward. Hopefully, you know, fingers crossed that maybe at some point they say we can get back together with class, but I'm not going to keep my head, uh, my hopes up for that. So. Be prepared for the class final to be online. Uh, I've already started developing that. I'm trying to figure out how to do the lab final. That's going to be the hard one because now I'm going to have to figure out that and I don't have access to the rocks right now. So I'm probably going to have to do some photography work and figure that out. But uh, we'll get there. That, that'll come. We'll figure it out. Meanwhile, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, I'll talk to you guys in the virtual classroom. Peace out.